Hello, this is a walkthrough of the OCR GCSE 9 to 1 Computer Science Paper 1, so Computer Systems Exam, and it's a sample question paper, which means it wasn't actually ever sat by anyone. This was just produced to give people an example of what a paper would look like for this course. And you can't forget it's a specimen because it's written across it in a big watermark on every page, which is a bit annoying, but there you are. So in terms of details of this paper, even though it's a specimen, it does it will be the same for an actual exam. So you can't use a calculator. There is barely any maths in this um, paper anyway, and it's an hour and a half long. And apart from that, I think that's roughly it. So it's worth 80 marks, but it doesn't matter hugely apart from the fact that you might do a minute a mark and you end up with 10 minutes about the end. And now the two exam, paper one is a more theory-based paper. Both you know, both require lots of theory, and I've got a complete set of videos that cover all the theory needed for both, by the way, on my channel in two different playlists. But this paper is more traditional. The second paper is more application-based. So there's a lot of writing in this paper, a lot of longer mark questions which require more writing so you know that's just something you've got to know going into it so I'm going to go through this paper without having seen the mark scheme beforehand so you can see me approach it perhaps more naturally um, let me know if you have any feedback of how I can improve these walkthrough videos um, and yeah let's uh, let's get started question one begins with Anne wanting to purchase a new computer and she's looking at two models and the specification of each CPU is shown in the table so one CPU's got a clock speed of 1 gigahertz, level 1.4, one has got a cache size of 2 megabytes, the other's got 2 megabytes, so the same, uh, and one's got 4 cores and one's got 2 cores. So when running a 3D flight simulator, computer 1 is likely to run faster than computer 2, identify one reason for this. So basically for all of these, as you increase them, the better performance is. So computer 1 is faster than computer 2 in terms of, the only way it's better is in terms of cores, so it's got twice as many cores. And, um, a core is there to a core it can be thought of as so a, a four core processing you can think of it being one processor with four individual mini processors basically or a CPU with four processors and that means in theory you can do four um, uh, computations in parallel so a graphics card works by having thousands of cores in, done in parallel um, but obviously it needs to be optimized to this to actually happen most applications do not make use of the four cores so despite the fact that computer 2 is a has a faster clock speed, so each core is operating faster than the two cores of uh, the four cores of computer 1, overall you've got twice as much computing power in theory, so that's why it would be um, beneficial for this purpose. Now we have to give two internal components that aren't in this table that can improve the performance of the computer. So what else is there really? So cache is a type of memory, but we could also talk in terms of RAM, which is a main problem. In fact, let's well, write it up here. Let's write it here. So um, and identify questions are as simple as just writing it down basically so you could increase RAM you could put a graphics card in so a GPU you could also instead of having a hard disk you could switch to an SSD um, this is such a generic question but um, it's just getting you to make it's just trying to make sure you know more than three types of hardware now we need to explain one reason why the cache size affects the performance of the CPU so cache so we've got a memory hierarchy so you can kind of think of it as a pyramid so at the top you've got at the top you've got registers basically then you've got cache so it's just see for cache and then you have ram and then i guess you've technically got your sort of hard drive space so in terms of speed as you go up the faster they are but the size goes down as you go up as well so cache is faster than ram in terms of the actual physical layout of the computer or the cpu so you've got your cpu and you've got your ram and the cache basically sits either on the CPU or I like to think of it just as in between um, and the cache if you were to draw just a scale in terms of actual size this would be tiny compared to the capacity of the RAM so basically uh, cache is faster than RAM so data can be moved to and from the processor faster as you increase the cache size more instructions can be held there obviously and so more instructions can benefit from this increase in speed now we need to identify four events that take place during the fetch execute cycle. So this is how the um, this is related to the clock. This is how the CPU processes all the data. So we have three stages to this basically. So we need one more. We have the fetch stage, obviously, the decode stage, and the execute stage. So um, we can talk about each individually. So first of all, an uh, instruction is fetched from or retrieved. We can say from memory. This instruction will be in the form of a you have your opcode and then you have your operand so if this was an instruction assembly it would be like add 
R1, R2. So you have your operand, which is your data, and then you have your instruction, which is actually what the operation is. So it needs to be decoded, basically. It needs to look up what the binary value is, what it corresponds to, and it needs to work out what is going on with the operand. So um, the, instru the control unit is what it does this. We don't really have to say that. So the instruction is decoded. Then the actual instruction is processed or executed, so carried out. Um, then let's just say then executed. And this is done by the ALU, so the arithmetic logic unit, then executed, so to carry out the instruction. And that's three marks just from kind of remembering the full name of this cycle. So the fourth thing we can say, we can basically say what we want. We could say that this cycle then restarts. So this would be for a single instruction and then it will restart. We could say that the program counter, which is a register increment. So the, the three registers you need to know about, I mentioned they're very small bits of memory that sit on the processor and very fast and so this stands for register 1, register 2 so you have general purpose registers like these two but you also have special purpose registers like the program counter and the MDR and the MAR which I believe are the three you need to know about so program counter is basically just a, well, it's a counter so it will increment by one each time because in theory and it doesn't always work like this because you have to jump between control structures in assembly code but in memory addresses are stored contiguously so this will be address 1, address 2, address 3 so all it needs to do at the end of a cycle is to plus 1 and then this will be this address get copied to the memory address register because this is, addressed, this is kind of a buffer for addresses because the RAM is slower than the CPU and the data is stored temporarily in the MDR so I think the simplest one to mention is the program counter so um, program counter is incremented which just means to increase and usually this would be plus one but if it jumped from memory address here to here we'd have to increment it by more than one obviously okay relatively gentle instruction I suppose if you've learned about hardware now I need to talk about secondary storage and more hardware in fact so Vicky has been on holiday taking lots of photos the memory is now full on her camera and she needs to transfer the photos to an external secondary storage device so we need to say what is meant by secondary storage so even though memory is kind of technically the overall topic, we often contrast memory and secondary storage. So memory is usually volatile and secondary storage is usually non-volatile. So volatile means it loses the data when power is turned off, whereas non-volatile retains the data. So it's a, a persistent storage. For part B, we need to identify the three common storage technologies Vicky can choose from. So basically, what types of secondary storage are there? So you have um, optical storage, which is like in the form of CD, so light um, is what reads the data. You also have magnetic storage, which is what most um, uh, hard disk drives are, and you also have solid state storage, which um, is what SSDs are made of. Then we need to state four characteristics of secondary storage devices that Vicky should consider when choosing a device. So lots of things here, we need four of them. So this is, you know, in terms of cost. Um, speed, so how fast data can be read or written to the device. Um, reliability is obviously very important. Can you trust it to work? The capacity, the actual size of the device is very important, obviously. And things like durability, you know, um, how easy is it broken? And portability as well. Different devices are more portable than others. So those are the kind of things you want to talk about. So you can choose any four of the ones I mentioned. And it's a state question, so you don't have to do any more than just listing them. Now we have Gareth who has a sat nav in his car that uses both RAM and ROM. RAM stands for random access memory and ROM stands for read only memory. So RAM, the na uh, for what RAM stands for doesn't really give away, but ROM read only memory is important because you can't um, in theory change the data once you've programmed it to the ROM. So once you've saved data on ROM you can't then take it back, you can't change it. Whereas RAM you can, but RAM is volatile, whereas ROM is non-volatile. So ROM retains the data and usually it's stored in very small amounts. So we have a table here, we have to tick which one of these sequences, um, each one of these statements is correct for either RAM or ROM. So first of all, which one stores the boot up sequence of the sat nav? Well this is going to be ROM and this is often the purpose of ROM to kind of load the operating system of the um, system, so the sat nav in this case. 
this wouldn't work for RAM because the data gets lost whenever the power is turned off and the whole point is you press the power button and it starts booting from ROM so that wouldn't work for RAM. Uh, next we have the contents are lost when Saturn is turned off, well I've already said that's RAM because RAM is volatile and then you have holds copies of open maps and routes and this is RAM, this is a bit more of knowledge of what the RAM in the computer does. So RAM, when you um, open a program it gets copied from usually your secondary storage device so a hard disk into your RAM where it's held because the RAM is directly connected to the processor so that's the sequence so you, when you open something it gets copied to RAM including the operating system so this bit here is a processor copying the operating system from the hard disk into your RAM so that's what this instruction is for it needs to tell the processor something and it will come via ROM which is somewhere else on the system anyway <laughs> I'm not sure how much sense that makes but this is a relatively simple question Garus Satnav has an embedded system in it. It's a fine was meant by an embedded system. So only one mark here, it um, doesn't need to be too complicated. So basically, it is what it says it is. It's a system um, uh, built in, you could say, or contained by a built in to another system or a larger system. Um, that is what an embedded system is. And if we have to now identify three devices other than a Satnav, for contain embedded systems, we could say, I mean, hundreds, uh, so many, any kind of complicated device really nowadays would have what's known as embedded system in. So maybe uh, the first one I think of is a washing machine, mostly because I've just put some washing on. So washing machine, um, a car will for sure have one, especially a modern car. Maybe even if you've got an expensive microwave or oven that will sort of have an embedded machine in, embedded system, I should say. So loads of examples, um, you can't go too wrong with this. Question 4 is the first algorithm question, it's worth 6 marks. So Bill needs to send a document across the network to Ben. We have to write an algorithm to show our packets are used to send the document, starting from when Bill clicks send and finishing when Ben reads the document. So there are two stages to this process, the sending and the receiving. So it doesn't say what format we need to put it in, so it could be a flowchart, it could be a, it could be pseudocode. So, you, I mean, pseudocode is, is um, a very high level representation, it's basically code that looks like it could be a programming language code but isn't it's just a general bit of code that anyone could understand but this is quite complicated it's um you probably have no experience programming protocols i don't know why you would um so this it might be quite hard to do pseudocode maybe a flowchart would be a better option here so as i say there are two stages maybe it's better to split them up into two stages as well so do sending first so let's just maybe just write sending so data when you send data it's you have your data and it's split up into packets and each packet is like a small section of the data along with the header or a, a header appended to the packet and in fact your header would obviously be very small in comparison to the actual data and you might have a footer as well but the header contains information like uh, the packet number so what number it is you know if it's the first packet if it's the last packet it needs to packets when they're sent across network say if you, you have a thousand packets that comprise this bit of data they're not necessarily going to arrive to, to Ben in the correct order. So that's why you need a packet number to say, okay, this is the first packet. So you can, Ben can, Ben's computer can reassemble it at the other end. And different protocols require different bits of data to be put in the header. So another one would be the address. That's really important for router. As it's sent through networks, routers have to know where it's gonna end up with so they can route it through networks. So it needs the address of Ben's computer. So basically we need to break the data up into packets and give the packets certain bits of information. So let's just, very quickly do a little start symbol so we can then we need a process symbol so let's do uh, uh, split data into packets as a process box so that's probably one mark to get the second mark so basically I should say six marks here there are two stages so let's go for three marks per stage so kind of three bullet points if this was a written question uh, so now let's do um, assign packet number address etc not very neat so if you're doing this you might want to do it in pencil or you might be a better artist than I am and then you actually send the data in fact we probably shouldn't do arrows um, send the data so let's just say so I think possibly the receiving requires a bit more understanding so another bit of data that the header needs that I forgot to say is the total number of packets there are in the sequence because it needs to know when it's finished receiving the data um, so we need a loop basically and that's often how this sort of thing works where if you're waiting for data you have to keep looping until it's all received or you get some other message so let's do start here uh, it's not a great start symbol anyway so we need a loop so basically we want to say um, all the packets received and for flowcharts the decision symbol is a 
uh, diamond. Oh dear, meant to be a diamond. And then you have so you will say uh, let's do yes or no, and again it will use well it will use the total number of packets and compare the packet number to that and it will put them in order and it can tell if it's missing one by the numbers not matching so are all packets received? No, so it has to basically loop and receive more packets otherwise if it is we can um, that'll be it but that's not going to be enough marks so we need to work out what else to say uh, we could say we need, to, um, we need to be reordered and displayed perhaps and in real life there'd be a check for errors by using possibly a checksum in the footer usually of the packet so check errors that could just be another process and we can do another uh, loop so um, are there errors I apologize for this being very messy are there errors maybe a float maybe a pseudocode would have been a better option actually in hindsight are there errors uh, no and we can just end because everything is okay. Um, else we need to resend or uh, yeah, request resend. So basically, you contact the person who sent it and get them to retransmit the uh, packet with an error in it. And this happens all the time. You know, this is a very complicated process. Sending tons of packets over the internet which you have no control over it's, it's a shared communication medium tons of errors get introduced but there are so many protocols that again it's always looping it will just continually loop and continually resend things and it will send acknowledgements once it's finished so basically there are tons of steps you could put in but you're looking to get the six marks so you want to have three distinct things from both sides and usually if you just mentioned if you were really comfortable with the sending process and did six points for the sending process I mean there are tons of things you can mention in this it's very complicated um, but if you just stuck to, to one side of this coin, you wouldn't get the full marks because often they're capped at probably three marks each or four marks each. So you have to include things from both sides and there should be enough information to get a six marks even if it is very messy. And if you were sensible and did pseudocode instead, which is usually my preference, again I probably should have gone for it here, it wouldn't look exactly like normal program code because you don't know how to do this with networks. So it would be much more high level, it would be like, it would be just a split data into packets assigned packet number in you know separate lines and then for this it would just be like a while loop so in fact that would definitely be more simple anyway that's uh, our six marks question five the owners of a large bakery have a local area network with a star topology they use the internet when data is transmitted from the bakery to the supplier network protocols are used I and mean, we've got to define what is meant by network protocol so network protocol is just a set of rules a that's okay we'll leave that a set of rules for communication or for data transmission so it does say transmitted so let's just use that set of rules for data transmission we could say across networks but it is in the term so for data transmission okay one mark the internet protocol suite tcp ip is a set of protocols based on layers and we need to define what is meant by a layer so tcp ip is a whole group of protocols and uh, it, it, tcp is an individual protocol so is ip and we have I think we looked at the four layer model there are also can be thought of in terms of five layers or seven layers um, and each different protocols operate at different layers basically and so each layer is representing a single part of the communication process so the top layer is the application layer then you have um, the, the link layer or basically just for hardware then you have the transport and you have the network so different aspects of the communication process so it's a little bit tricky to, tricky to define but really um, it's a way of dividing up um, similar protocols so each do a single part of the, tra uh, of the transmission process. Okay, a bit convoluted but I said a conceptual way of dividing the communication process so each fulfills a single aspect of it. Each layer is doing its own thing and each layer is self-contained which ties into the next question which is to describe one advantage of using layers to construct network protocols. So um, we don't have to give one advantage but as I say they're self-contained so basically if you're a programmer um, and you're dealing with, you, you want to program an alternative to TCP. TCP exists at a transport layer so if you you basically when data is sent it works its way down from the applications through the link layer and is sent to the other the receiving computer which works its way up the layers again. So each layer has an input and an output actually well that's not true apart from the application layer but basically it's very well defined so they're self-contained and well defined um, self just say self-contained so 
um, one can be changed without affecting other protocols. So, so that's I think a clear advantage. Another one is just for general idea of decomposition, i.e. breaking a problem down into subproblems. For each doing their own thing, they're each doing an aspect of the problem. So you can focus if you're programming a protocol, focus on one aspect of the transmission process. If you to do a single protocol for all of this, it would be very difficult. And you can switch stuff out. So if you wanted to, so an alternative to TCP is UDP, which you don't need to know about. But UDP does the same same idea as DCP. It has a different, it has an advantage and has a disadvantage. So for things like online gaming, UDP might be really good. So maybe twenty percent of all your connections might be UDP, maybe slightly less. But effectively, you as a, a consumer of the internet have no idea that your computer is using TCP or UDP and neither does the application level protocols or network or link layer they don't really care what's going on at the transport layer as long as the things reach uh, the destination and things go smoothly that's okay the actual implementational details of each layer is not that relevant to other layers or us as consumers which is one of the ben benefits of splitting this whole process up for part C we have to explain four reasons why Boken may use a star network topology for their LAN. So a topology is just the arrangement of your nodes in the network and the star topology has, in fact let's do it, you have a central node and then you have other nodes connected to it like this. So the central node might be like a, uh, a router, a switch, basically it, everything's going through a single, or it could be a server, just a single node in the centre. So why is this advantageous? So first of all, it's very easy to add nodes to this. You only have to add a single bit of cable basically to your central node. So let's just say uh, easy to add nodes, a node being just a device. If you had a mesh topology, you'd have to basically connect the new node to every other node as well. You don't have to do this with a star topology. Um, a second reason is managed um, centrally. So a consequence of that is if this node is wanting to send to this node, all it needs to do is pass it on. In other topologies, uh, which you don't really need to know about, you would have to transmit this to every other node in the network. So here you only have to transmit to the node you actually want to instead of all other nodes. So first of all, um, it's managed centrally, which is kind of a reason in itself, and also the consequence being, well you get less um, collisions, because if it was managed centrally, it's not going to... Um, it can organize the flow of data whereas if you had so an alternative which like I say you don't need to know about is a bus topology and in this you have all your devices connected to a single bus and the data gets sent up and down and basically you get loads of collisions or data gets messed up whereas here you've got a central connection it's not as risky uh, so let's say uh, fewer data collisions Data collision is just where it sort of gets jumbled up basically just by having loads of data transmitting at the same time and it has to get resent. Uh, and the fourth reason it's uh, if you if one of the devices goes down, it's not going to affect the rest of the network. If, it, if the central device goes down, the whole network's going down. But we're talking, um, this is why they may use it instead of why they wouldn't use it. So uh, a single node, uh, a single node, let's say failure, does not affect. Yeah, the rest of the network does not affect. So four is a bit of a stretch to be fair, but it shows you that you could easily get the other side of the question as well. F explain what four reasons why you wouldn't want to use this and the same for mesh as well. So you've got to have some ideas in your head of why. So if things like the central device failing and needing lots of cable and so on and this being slower than the mesh network. Okay, so we can move on then to number six. And we have a surgery that stores hundreds of patients' details on its network and it's concerned about the security of its patient's sensitive medical data. The staff already use strong passwords to protect systems. Explain with reference to system security three other ways that the surgery could protect the system. So we have six marks worth of this question again. We have not given much space. So really, looking at exam technique, six marks, we're going to give three reasons. So we need to give, you know, state the reason and then quickly explain it for the other mark in that pair. Okay, so the first one I suggest would be encryption. So the process of making data secret so the person who doesn't have access to the decryption key can't read the sensitive data that seems the most obvious way to protect the data just by encrypting it to outsiders so if they got hacked the data would be scrambled up they wouldn't be able to decrypt it without the key so encryption so data becomes unreadable to unauthorized viewers so a doctor or someone who works at the practice would be able to decrypt the data, but anyone else wouldn't be able to. Uh, an answer examiners love is anti-malware software, so or antivirus software, so anti 
malware eg let's say eg spyware perhaps that's all about data spyware uh, infecting the computer or infecting the systems another measure which formed quite a large part of the video on uh, prevention was uh, network policies so not all of them would be that, not all of them are that relevant to this specifically but the acceptable use policy is so that specify acceptable use of staff or by staff so for example you want it to be a policy that if you are a doctor you don't leave medical information lying around you don't print medical information out perhaps you turn your computers off at night you don't use your own USB devices so those kind of policies are there to protect for data so we could say um, e.g. no emailing of information so perhaps when you join the surgery as a staff member you have to agree to not send information beyond the surgery so those kind of policies aren't that obvious but are probably quite important to make it clear to people who aren't maybe that technically savvy what they can and can't do to protect the data and now for a very similar type of question again worth six marks we have to identify three errors that the surgery staff could make for maintaining the security of the network and outline a procedure that could be put in place to prevent each error so again it'll be one mark for specifying the error and another mark for saying how they could prevent it so a lot of these would be covered by what I just said for acceptable use policy so we can talk about things I mentioned in fact so this example might be better placed here but we could use the other one of uh, the USB devices so um, we could say ringing or connecting external devices e.g. USB devices onto the network block USB ports which is quite common in offices to not to basically just prevent the USB ports from working by software just so you can't you know transfer software via USB that could be malware physical security is often overlooked especially by you know computer scientists but physical security is important as well so um, uh, allowing access to systems uh, better probably to give an example here because it's difficult to define it so e.g. Um, um, unlock through unlocked doors and because physical security is not often considered often it's quite a popular choice by examiners to mention so uh, even for unlocked e.g. for unlocked doors so it could prevent with a security policy with key cards maybe and you could have user access levels if you are you know doing maintenance you shouldn't have access to the computers the doctors use for example you've used access levels for that a third thing you could mention is downloading um, downloading uh, let's say I could just say Trojans perhaps a class of malware where it's hidden as it looks like it's a proper file but in fact it's got malware within it which people do all the time, perhaps, or used to be through email attachments most often. Question seven is about a restaurant that has a ordering system which is running slowly, and a technician has said that the hard disk drive is fragmented, and they suggested using a uh, defragmentation piece of software. So we need to explain how the restaurant's hard disk could have got fragmented in the first place, so that's for four marks, we need four distinct points here. So pretending this is the hard drive, if you've got some data here, and some data here, and then you delete some of this data so that's not worked as I expected but anyway um, we can when you put more data in but it's more than it was before it gets fragmented this is where you, what fragmentation is where it gets split up basically and so this causes it to become slow the access time becomes slow because you then have to look at both places as opposed to just a contiguous block of data like it would be if it didn't get split up because basically when you delete stuff it leaves, it leaves gaps in the hard disk not literally but in terms of data being missing so it fills in the gaps but of course it can get split up so why we have to you know attach that to this example of given about restaurants so they um, they use the system for orders so you can imagine orders getting added to this hard disk constantly and they constantly get removed so um, we could say orders are saved 
on the disk then uh, probably I mean, we're kind of guessing here I deleted um, well certainly when they're fulfilled I don't know when that would be exactly when they are or say completed um, so once it's been cooked basically uh, so uh, so that would be probably one mark I mean the second mark then so we can say uh, gaps are left when deleted and new orders uh, may not and new orders may be larger than those gaps and so this means um, this means the new files get split up and you can imagine this happening a lot over just a single evening even tons of orders coming in files get split up so this could quite easily become a problem and drastically slow down the system uh, so let's check this in our heads and just make sure we get our four bullet points and you're kind of preempting what the examiner is going to look for so orders are saved on the disk then deleted so that's probably a single mark for the first process of it gaps are left when deleted that's probably another mark and the orders may be larger than those gaps so that's just for the general process of fragmentation and then the final point as well so that should be four marks and exam boards often use an example to kind of lead into the question but here they've actually used it in the question which is why it's kind of a clue that you should really be tying your answer to the restaurant scenario so logically we now have to explain how defragmentation software can fix this problem of this local computer system so worth three marks really we're looking for again exam technique two marks for this process and then another mark for how it can fix the issue why this actually helps so what this is doing really is rearranging the data to get split up so so data is moved so uh, files are grouped together and so small gaps no longer appear so that's kind of our first two marks I don't know where they would occur exactly but that should cover the whole uh, you know description we only need to say we only need to say how this actually helps so access time is faster because fewer individual accesses or reads individual say, accesses are needed as I said before you have to when data split up you have to basically read it twice as opposed to just as a single unit you have to go okay read it once read it twice as opposed to just a single you know five blocks or whatever how long it is so that speeds up the process and because it's on a hard disk and it's a you know physical disk and it's got a little I can't draw this but a little kind of reader it, so if some data is stored here and some data is stored here and they're both for the same thing that's going to create a drastic difference in read time I mean it's so fast anyway but still you know if it was next to each other like it should be that's clearly going to be a lot faster for question 8 a law firm currently use a local area network linked to a wide area network and we want to upgrade their system to utilize cloud storage define what's meant by wide area network there are actually two parts of this definition usually part A is that they are the most obvious one is that devices are physically or geographically let's say physically it's shorter physically um, further physically far away from each other so that's definitely would get you a single mark but the second part of this if it was a two mark if they were being slightly harsher is that they share communication medium so um, communication medium shared i.e. they use some cable that's owned by an ISP so if you had a local network in say your house you if you, if you own your house you own all the cables in the house whereas if you then connect to the internet you're using some other cables that are owned by an ISP maybe by government maybe by another private citizen so you're using some shared communication medium like a wire we then need to explain to advantages to the law firm of storing my data in the cloud so this is the key bit again we've got to link it to the law firm and four marks so again it'll be two marks per advantage so first I mean there are tons of tons of advantages you could talk about so we've got to limit limit it to two um, first of all uh, data is backed up or should be backed up by the cloud provider so say and this obviously takes time and money and it's sort of an automatic aspect of cloud storage second is that um, it allows quick scaling up so storage capacity can be scaled up as the firm grows 
and you know does my work the cloud providers have so much storage available they're not going to run out of storage for you as you would very easily as just you know your individual law firm other things you could talk about are security the fact that you don't need administrators to do this for you like the backup process which is sort of what i'm talking about here it's also quite good for the environment um, they, if you've got a huge, huge server room that stores loads of data, they've got to be very energy efficient. They don't want to spend tons of money on electricity. The cloud provider, whereas in, in, on a small level, it's not as good for the environment. You're using more energy than you should be, really, because you've got cheaper equipment. We then need to explain two disadvantages of storing the data in the cloud. So I mentioned that security is provided by the provider, well, the provider, but not necessarily. So um, security. Is external, so you've no control over it. But to link this to the firm, but the firm is liable. So if you've got data on a serious case and it gets hacked, you know, the, the, no one's going to care that um, OneDrive has lost a file. It's going to be the firm's fault. So the firm is liable if it fails. And a second, probably more obvious point, which I neglected to mention first, is you need a data connection. Or you need the internet. <laughs> the better way of saying that. And if you are travelling, if you are, you know, working on a train, you don't have access to your files, perhaps because they're all stored online. So lawyers cannot work offline. Of course, assuming that everything is kind of forced to be on the cloud. So you've got to make sure you bring it to the law firm at every opportunity. If you just did general points, you'd probably not get full marks. In fact, you almost certainly wouldn't get full marks. You really have to tie it in when they use an example. It's a, it's a clue that you need to get those sort of points in to get the marks. D shows some actions which may take place in the law firm's office and we have to tick the relevant uh, legislation for each action. So we have the Data Protection Act, which is all the things the company has to do when they have consumers data stored in their servers. The Computer Misuse Act, which is all about hacking and the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, which is about intellectual property and stealing people's ideas and stuff. So first of all, using a picture for the law firm's new logo without the original creator's permission, well this is going to be uh, the CDPA, because that's all about copyright. If you create a logo you have copyright automatically, you have to get permission before using someone else's work. And we haven't got permission here. The second one is a secretary accessing a lawyer's personal email account without permission. This is the Computer Misuse Act. You can't, without, it's all about permission, this. Um, in fact all three of them are kind of Data Protection Act is less about permission, it's more about your rights as a consumer, i.e. you can call up and get them to change your data and so on or show your data, things like that. So these two are more about permission. This is kind of about permission, I suppose. Uh, next one is making a copy of the latest Hollywood film and sharing it with a client. This is going to be uh, the Designs and Patents Act because it's copyrighted, you can't still, this is without, a, well a copy is what's giving this away really. Next one, storing customer's data insecurely. This is going to fall under the Data Protection Act. One of the principles of it is you have to secure the data. Uh, next one is a lawyer installing a keylogger on the secretary's computer. This would be the Computer Misuse Act. You haven't got permission to do that. And the final one, selling clients personal legal data to a marketing company without their permission. This would be the Data Protection Act. Again, that's one of the conditions of this. You can't um, so that's where permission comes into it really. You have to get permission to send data on to a third party. Okay, relatively simple, I think. You do need to learn the laws in more detail. I think if you didn't know them, you hadn't revised them, you'd still get this. But there could be questions on them individually, which you would need to have revised properly. The final question in the paper is a nine marker, which is, is an eight marker, I should say, about, in fact, let's read it out. So even though the computer devices they own still work, people often want to buy the most up-to-date models, such as the latest smartphone. Discuss the impact of people wanting to upgrade to the latest smartphone, and you should consider the impact on stakeholders, technology, ethical issues, and environmental issues. So this isn't a question where the mark scheme is very defined. It's a, uh, I forget what it's called, but you've got to use proper English here, so you can't do bullet points like you could in other questions. So um, I won't write this out by hand, but you should really do a very quick draft, I think, for these kind of questions. You don't want to waffle. You want to be quite concise and link your answer quite nicely. So some, so a stakeholder is just anyone roughly involved. So things like par people like parents, the technology companies, the people themselves, perhaps children who are wanting to update. There might be more pressure. So ethical issues might be things like peer pressure. Um, you know, if you've got an old phone, people might, uh, you know, pressure you into getting a new one. And that might affect a parent. Um, sort of thing you can talk about environmental issues. If phones aren't being disposed of, 
like recycled so phones not recycled um, like we talked about resource depletion so for example in phones there are very small trace um, elements of gold and copper and so on and they just get lost when they're not recycled um, and technology itself what could you talk about you could say well it's more of an ethical I was going to say the divide between you know rich and poor or rich countries and poor countries and the technology itself if um, you know if Apple release a new phone every year people often say in the run up to a new iPhone getting released that their phones are suddenly slower now how much is that conspiracy or how much is that actually a fact that do the companies deliberately slow down phones do they deliberately make the software um, the hardware not very durable so that's the sort of things you could talk about and it's a worth eight marks it's not going to be like before where it's two marks per thing you talk about it could be it is no strict it's up to the examiner basically it's how well you write it up so if you were to do a little plan like I've done here which I recommend you might want to go okay first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, peer pressure to um, so get a new phone number two effect on just ethical issues so like um, you know, social divide And financial the cost of any phones are very expensive so you can mention cost as well and you might want to mention we've well, got to mention environmental so you could say uh, no recycling and then you could say something about like hardware um, or phones being not durable are you breaking easily so you want to have a little plan and this might be a good way to go so it's worth eight marks and like I say it's not a strict mark scheme where it's like two marks per point but that might be a good way of working out or ensuring you have something for everything so you really if it gives you bullet points in this sort of exam you want to cover each of them so by mentioning parents or stakeholders or something like that okay because my handwriting is getting worse and worse I decided to write it up I hope this is about the right length as it would be if I wrote it up maybe it's a bit longer but I generally just I converted my little plan into paragraphs and I tried to write it up properly so what I've said is people often want to upgrade their working phones due to pressure maybe from peers or advertising this may put financial pressure on themselves or other stakeholders like their parents if it's a teenager perhaps who pays for their phone and the high cost of the phones may increase the social divide you know, inequality as the shareholders of the companies become richer but the consumers become poorer from spending so much money on the phones and also you've got to bring it back to the environment so this is kind of stakeholders ethics uh, uh, those two bullet points in environmental so the replaced phones may not be recycled which contributes to resource depletion of things like gold and maybe like things like mercury that are in very small amounts but aren't ever recovered and in general the manufacturing process of making the phones obviously needs a lot of energy use and that's mostly going to come from unrenewable sources which is obviously very bad for the environment and finally it's, it was a point on technology so I might I and also you could bring it to ethical by saying that uh, this trend of people wanting new phones may also encourage more unethical behaviour by manufacturers of deliberately, so I need to be careful, it, you'd lose marks if you made spelling mistakes, of deliberately producing products which are not durable so they have to be replaced quicker. So make sure, like I didn't, make sure you read through your answer before you leave it. And um, yes, that's the most important thing, making sure you have a coherent answer. You don't need tons of points. If you drag out a point by really making loads of logical connections, you'll get full marks on this question. So that's it. Um, I hope this video was useful. Let me know if you have any feedback or questions, and I hope your actual exam goes really well.